At elementary school, if I got punched, I punched back. If someone fouled me when I was playing football or soccer, I tackled them the hardest at the first opportunity I could get. That will teach them it was my attitude. But that attitude isn't confined to little boys at school. When we're wronged, most of us want to put it right. We want that person to pay for it. The desire for revenge is a very, very common human emotion. It may take a long, long time for that person to get what they deserve, but we remember the wrong they inflicted on us, and sooner or later, we hope we will have the opportunity to take our revenge. I've known many people to go through life with deep, deep grudges, deep resentments, deep anger, as they think of how they were wronged in the past, of how they were wronged by a former wife or a husband, a parent, a child, a business partner, a colleague, a brother and sister in Christ. They want payback. They want revenge. Some people get even by what they say, that sarcastic remark designed to settle a score, that criticism or gossip behind the back, that false accusation. Others get even by their attitudes. They adopt a superior attitude. They ignore someone. They will have nothing to do with that person. Others get even by their actions. They retaliate in kind. They follow the law of the jungle, as it were, and they're glad when disaster overtakes that individual that they feel has wronged them. And let's face it, there's a certain pleasure in getting even, isn't there? In getting our revenge. But the Bible makes it very clear that those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ are not, please hear me, are not to indulge in revenge. Revenge is not to be part of the Christian vocabulary. But what are we to do when people hurt us, when people defraud us, when people betray us, when people take advantage of us, when people abuse us? The answer at least in part, is found in our passage this morning, if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to it, to Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. We saw last week, as we looked at verses 9 through 13 of Romans 12, the importance of genuine love demonstrated to our fellow believers. But now, in verses 14 through 21, uh, we are dealing, Paul deals with Yes, our genuine love towards our fellow believers, but also to the unbeliever, in fact, also to our enemies. Now, before we look at these verses, we need to be very, very clear on one fundamental matter, that this love which Paul is talking about, beginning in verse 9 where he says, let love be genuine, and going on to the end of the chapter, this love doesn't gain us merit with God. We have repeatedly learned in the book of Romans over these months that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is, we cannot, we cannot earn God's love. But the wonderful truth of the Christian gospel is that God loves us despite our failures, despite our sin, despite our unholiness. No, not one of us deserves the love of God. But this genuine love, this love comes from God to us, that God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're gathered this morning around the communion table, which tells us as we look at the cross that God loves us, not because we are wonderful people, not because we deserve it, not because you love God, but because God loves you. And the very character of God is love, and He has shown that love to us supremely in His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So this love that we're talking about is not produced by self-discipline or personal determination. Rather, it is receiving God's love as a gift, that God demonstrates His love for us. He shows us His love in this wonderful gift of His Son, 
who on the cross pays the price for our sins, for our revengeful attitudes and actions, for our unholiness, for our rebellion. Our Savior dies in our place, and we rejoice not only in His death for our sins, but His glorious resurrection, so He's alive. And the Bible says that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. And only then will you personally understand something of this love of God in your heart, because in the miracle of conversion, God pours His love into your heart through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. And now we can begin to love God as we should. We love because He first loved us. And we begin to love our brothers and sisters here at Calvary. Let's face it, that's sometimes not easy, is it? And even in the miracle of conversion, as we will see, we can love our enemies. This is supernatural love. It's the divine love. It's the love of God which followers of Jesus are to show in the face of evil, in the face of unrighteousness, in the face of false accusation, in the face of suffering and persecution. Here is love in action. Our love for we receive from God, but now our love impacting a world which is hostile to our Lord Jesus Christ. This is part, an important part, an essential part of the transformation of the gospel. We need to understand that Jesus Christ never leaves us where we are. When He impacts our life, we are changed, and we begin to see everything different. The old is gone, the new has come. Here is love in action. Will you stand and read with me the text of Scripture, Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 20. One. Now, think of what the Spirit of God is saying in these verses. Read them with me. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thank you. Please be seated. The transformation of the gospel. Now, in verses 14 and 15 and 16, Paul is saying, Genuine love is gracious to all. It is gracious to everyone. Verse 14, Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Genuine love blesses people and doesn't curse them. Now, this is just, this is more than just ignoring the persecution. This is more than just ignoring the wrong. I think most of us would think we're pretty good if we were living for Christ and there's hostility and there's persecution and we just walk away from it. We think, I've done pretty well. But the Spirit is saying, no, you have to do more than that. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. That is the teaching of the New Testament said by our Lord Himself, is that we are to love the persecutor. Turn back in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Here's the third Gospel. Luke chapter 6, the teaching of our Lord in what we call the Beatitudes. Here is the 
Lucan account, Luke 6, verse 27. But I say to you who, who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Do you have any enemies? Do you know people who hate you? Could even be a family member. Could be a former business colleague. Could even be a parent, a brother, someone who hates you. What, what am I to do? I'm to do good to that person who hates you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. This is what Paul is saying here. When faced with the hostility to the gospel, ask God to bless that person rather than wanting some disaster to overtake them. That is the human emotion, isn't it? Someone hurts me. Someone injures me in some way, persecutes me, and I want something done to hurt them, and I want it done as quickly as possible. No, says Paul, I don't want you to do that. Rather than curse the person, I want you to bless them. There is to be no verbal retaliation by followers of Jesus. Listen to Peter who was a man who spoke very, very quickly, but writing as an older and wiser man under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, as he looks at Jesus, he records this, 1 Peter 2, verse 23, when he, our Lord, was reviled, he did not revile in return. Is that because he didn't know what to say? Oh, no. He could have silenced his accusers immediately. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. What did he do? He continued entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That is, he left it all to his Father and his God. So this genuine love, which I receive from God, this genuine love that I'm to grow more and more as I become more and more like Jesus, calls for God's blessing on our persecutors, not cursing them. Now, if that is true as to how we should respond to our persecutors, how much more to a person who merely hurts us or offends us? What do you do when someone offends you? Do you curse them? Man, some of you are too quick with cursing and swearing. Swearing and cursing should not be part of the Christian's vocabulary. You show your annoyance in some other way. How do you respond to that bad or arrogant driver who cuts you off? You say, well, Paul's not talking about bad driving. No, he's not. That's true. But if I am to bless my persecutor as I follow Christ, isn't it logical to think that just when I am merely inconvenienced, I shouldn't respond out of temper, out of swearing, out of shouting, out of shaking my fist? Is that any way for a follower of Christ to act? What do you do when you're inconvenienced? Do you shout? Do you swear? Man, do you shout at your children? Do you swear at them? I I've, don't play golf much, but I played with men at golf when they, when they miss the putt, they curse. That's pretty bad, isn't it? You say, well, you're not much of a golfer. It's really tough when you miss that putt. I understand that. But to curse and to swear, no. Whoever the person is, whether it's our best friend or our enemy or a persecutor, we are to be known as people of blessing so that people are helped by their interaction with us, not cursed. So genuine love blesses, not curses. Verse 15, genuine love is sympathetic. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. 
weep with those who weep. It's often said it's easier to weep with people than to rejoice with them, but we're to do both. We are to rejoice with those who rejoice. Do you do that? See, the natural reaction sometimes is to be envious or to be bitter or to be resentful or angered when someone is successful. Certainly if a person has wronged us, we don't want them to be rejoicing. We want them to suffer. But Paul is saying, in all cases, I am to rejoice. See, genuine love enters into the joys and the sorrows of others. Because this love is not some selfish self-indulgence, but it reaches out and is sympathetic and understands what's going on in the lives of others. Whether this person is rejoicing, if they're rejoicing, I'm rejoicing with them. If they're suffering, I'm suffering with them. If, I am, if they are weeping, I am weeping with them. Genuine love rejoices, and genuine love weeps. Think of the example of our Lord. He's rejoicing at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. In fact, through His miracle, the joy and the rejoicing increase as He turns the water into wine. Turn over a few chapters in John, and we come to John 11. And a dear friend of his dies, and the sisters Mary and Martha are absolutely devastated at the death of their brother. And Jesus, even though he knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, what does he do? Jesus weeps. So that the Jews say, oh, how he loved him. When, when did you last weep with a friend? A friend who was suffering. We live in a cold world, don't we? We live in a very busy world where so many of us are wrapped up in our little iPhone and our own little life and our own little family, and sometimes we fail to understand what's going on in our neighborhood or what's going on with our brothers and sisters in Christ and what's going on in society. This love, this love of God, it transforms us. It transforms society as we rejoice with people and weep with them. Furthermore, verse 16, this genuine love is humble. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. We saw this before in chapter 12, didn't we? This love that comes from God is not conceited or arrogant. Genuine love doesn't act superior to people. No, genuine love, the love of God, treats everyone alike, irrespective of who they are. Paul's going to remind us in chapter 13, verse 9, that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. What does arrogance do? What does pride do? It divides us from others. But genuine love is not prejudiced against people. In the family of God, surely we understand this that we're all equal in the family of God. We're all sinners. We're all saved by the same grace. This Lord's table reminds us that we've all come into the kingdom of God the same way, all through the grace of God, and that God not only loves me, but He loves you, and that you are His Son, and I am His Son, and we're equal in the sight of God, and therefore, how could it be that any of us could be characterized by arrogance or conceit. No, there is to be in the Christian community no elitism, no racism, no superiority of one people over another. You know, I taught the membership class uh, yesterday, and uh, I don't know what they thought of it. I enjoyed it. Goes from 9 to 12. 15. That's a long time, isn't it? But what a blessing for them. But there we were. <laughs> and there's about 40 people. I don't know if, if we got all of the nationalities. Everyone didn't introduce themselves. But those who did, there were people from Ghana. There were people from Ethiopia. There was people from Nigeria. There was a young man fought from Columbia. That's Columbia, South America, not South Carolina. 
And uh, then there was a young lady from a place I'd never even heard of until I moved here. It's west of here. It's called Gastonia. She was from there. <laughs> and I thought, here we are in this little room, brothers and sisters in Christ, that God in His grace brings different nations, different ethnicities, different personalities, different backgrounds, and He brings us together. And Paul is saying here, listen to it, live in harmony with one another. Our society can't do that. We think of the terrible tragedy of the last few days in that beautiful islands of New Zealand where some supposed white supremacist goes and mows down people who are worshiping. Yes, we don't agree with their theology, but they're men and women and boys and girls made in the image of God. And this goes on in our world. Such hatred. Such hatred. Such division. Such superiority of some people over others in their own thinking. How wonderful that here in the family of God, Paul says, live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. You see, this genuine love is humble. I well remember as a young man, as I began my legal career in the first law firm I worked with, the, the uh, senior partner was a a brilliant lawyer and a very, very strong Christian, very gracious, very humble. But because he was so good, he had clients who were, who were high up at the very top of society. But I used to marvel as I would see him with his arm on the shoulder of some old widow who hadn't very much money. In fact, he probably never even charged them, and he was so kind and so gracious. And I used to think to myself, how is it that he can have such time for such individuals? What was he doing? He was doing what Paul says here, don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. That's the transformation of the gospel, isn't it? See, when you're good, when you're well-educated, when you're making a lot of money, it is very, very easy, isn't it, to think, well, I've achieved this. Who cares about people below me? But the transformation of the gospel is this, that we associate with every single person for followers of Jesus. There is to be no social or economic or intellectual or cultural elite in the church of Jesus Christ. There's to be no snobbery. There's to be no envy. We're very different. We're to appreciate, and Paul has told us this earlier in chapter 12, we're to appreciate not only our unity, but also our diversity, so that there is an absence of prejudice. What a wonderful testimony to the world, isn't it? Think of what's going on out there in our society. Obviously, not just here in the United States, but throughout the world. And it is in the church of Jesus Christ that people, whoever they are, that they come and they experience the love of God, yes, through the proclamation of the Word, yes, through the gospel, but also through people like you and me, so that as you came here, I trust you reached out to people around you, whether you met somebody in the parking lot or the gallery or after the service, to reach out to someone and say, I don't think I know you how wonderful that we've come together to worship the Lord. See, this genuine love is transforming, isn't it? it? It changes how we look at ourselves and how we look at other people. This love is gracious to everyone. It, it's, it's humble. I have a friend, he's now with the Lord. Uh, he was a cardiologist, and his uncle uh, was a very famous uh, physician in England. His name was Randall Short. And Randall Short was internationally known as a, a brilliant physician. And the story is told of Randall Short that in the hospital uh, one day, uh, and it wasn't his speciality at all, but he saw this this uh, woman right from the streets uh, in, in the corridor waiting for some medical attention, and in the busyness of the hospital, no one could be bothered with her. 
Uh, she was dirty, she was smelly, and people were busy. And Randall Short stopped. She didn't know who he was. And he asked her what was wrong. And she had some, some, some terrible, putrid, messy, sm smelly infection in her feet. And this brilliant surgeon literally got down on his hands and knees and, and cleaned this woman's feet and, and cleaned the wound and helped her. And his colleagues who were so superior, they thought, what's, what's Short doing taking care of that old hag? Until, and, until someone said, well, you know Randall Short, he treated her as a princess. That's the transformation of the gospel, isn't it? That makes a difference. That silences the argumentative person when we realize that this gospel, this transformation of the gospel changes us, freeing us from our self-absorption and self-indulgence and our own narrow little life, and we begin to see the world and people as God sees it. Now, verses 17 through 21. Genuine love does not seek revenge. I know that's what the Bible says. <laughs> I'm like you. I'd like to get my revenge on some people as well. But we can't do it. This genuine love, first of all, verses 17 and 18, is peaceable. Repay no one evil for evil. Do you hear me? Repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Genuine love is peaceable. It's, it, it's, it's humble. It doesn't curse. It's sympathetic. But it's peaceable. We are, who follow Jesus, to be characterized by doing what is good and not evil. Don't repay evil for evil. Has anyone ever done evil against you? I am sure each one of us could say, could give many examples where someone has done evil against us. They've done it or they've said something against us which is just evil. No, I'm not to do that. I'm to be a peacemaker. Didn't Jesus say, blessed are the peacemakers? For they shall be called the sons of God. Easy to be a troublemaker. Easy to be a rabble rouser, particularly in today's society. But we're not to be contentious. We're not always to be complaining about every circumstance. We're not always to be in the middle of an argument. No, we're not to be troublemakers. And I realize sometimes it's impossible to avoid contention. But the Scripture is saying, as far as you can, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, the other person maybe doesn't want to be at peace with you, but as far as you're concerned, do all you can to live peaceably with all. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? You're, are you a, a peacemaker? The world wants to see, don't they, fleshed out the gospel that were people of honor, that were people of integrity, living in harmony with others, in your family, at work. There's something wrong, isn't it, at your work, if people say you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're always the troublemaker. You're always criticizing the boss. You're always complaining to people and getting people in a state of agitation. That's not the way of the Christian. If possible, so far as it depends on you, verse 18, live peaceably with all. And in today's world of tweeting and texting and social media, it's so easy to get embroiled in some name calling and, and controversies, isn't it? I mean, you, you put out an innocent tweet or, or and, and, and someone wants to have an argument with you. And if you're like me, you want to say, hey, I can argue better than you can. I can put you right in your place. And it's so easy, isn't it, to get embroiled in, in a sense, matters which don't really matter. Live peaceably with all. 
Some people would fight with their own shadow, wouldn't they? Learn how to deal with irritating people at work. Learn how to deal with hostile people, perhaps even in your own family. Don't allow others to rob you of the peace that God gives you. You're a prisoner of it. It wakes you up at night, and you're thinking about this controversy. It's live at peace. I realize sometimes it is impossible to be at peace with people. And yes, we're to stand for our convictions. I'm not talking about you being a wimp. I'm talking about strength, but strength under control. In the Gospels, remember in the garden, they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, here are two swords. Who takes one? Peter. What does he do with it? He, not very good swordsman, he ends up with the servant of the high priest, cuts off the guy's ear. What happened to the other sword? We don't know. Here is someone who had a sword, who had the power to smite but didn't use it. To have the power to smite and not to use it is strength twofold. You don't have to respond just because you can, just because you can win the argument, just because the other person is obnoxious. The Bible is saying here, repay no one evil for evil. Is this difficult? Yes. But this is the transformation of the gospel. Now, in verses 19 through 21, we see that genuine love is not vengeful. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves. That's pretty clear, isn't it? But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then verse 21, what a magnificent summary. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Anyone here ever been offended, <laughs> mistreated, hurt, betrayed, misunderstood, unfairly criticized? All of us put up both hands, don't we? We can all identify with this. What are you to do? Don't take vengeance. Vengeance is God's prerogative. Yes, God sees it, and God is going to put it right, but leave it to God. This is a matter of living by faith. God knows all about your situation. He understands the hurt. He understands the betrayal. He understands the deep, deep wounds that you have received because of the way this person has acted towards you or has said something or done something. And it's painful, but leave it to God. God is just, and He will dispense what you cannot do. He will dispense perfect justice in His own time and in His own way. I read from 1 Peter 2, verse 23, where our Lord, when He was reviled, He didn't revile in return. When He suffered, He didn't threaten. But what did He do? He entrusted Himself to the one who judges righteously. Who's that? His Father and His God. Leave it to God. God is the one who will deal with that person. Don't you take that into your hands. Now, I will be the first to say that not taking vengeance is contrary to human nature. The motto of my native land, Scotland, is nemo me impuni lacesset. There it is. And if you don't understand your Latin, it is no one attacks me with impunity. There you are. That tells you something about the Scottish nation, doesn't it? The English have as their emblem a rose. What do we have as our emblem in Scotland? A thistle. That shows what a prickly people we are. <laughs> and after centuries of English people trying to take our land and rule us, we believe that you fight back, and you fight back harder than you can, and you respond quickly. That is really part of the Scottish DNA. Some of you know that about me. And this, it means no one who harms me is going to be unpunished. Now, that may be Scotland's motto, but it's the very opposite of what Paul is teaching. I recently read a book about the Israeli secret service, Mossad, and on the front cover of the book, 
Uh, there's a quote from the Babylonian Talmud, the tractate Sanhedrin, and it says this, if someone comes to kill you, rise up and kill them first. Now, that may be appropriate for a country defending itself. I understand that. But not in your personal relationships. Paul is saying, don't take vengeance into your own hands. We've been studying the life of David. Here is David. He's the anointed king. He's told he's going to be uh, the king of Israel and of Judah. Uh, but there's a very evil man, Saul, who's presently king. And Saul is trying to kill David, and he's hunting him in the wilderness, and he's got his army to get hold of David and to put a javelin through his heart. And on a couple of occasions, David and his men come upon Saul, and he's asleep. He's not being guarded very well. The guard duty have fallen asleep, and they're right there, and they say to David, here is your chance. You can kill your enemy Saul right here. In fact, I've got a javelin, and I'll put it right through him right now and they'll only need one attempt to kill him. And David says, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't put your hand against the Lord's anointed. And on one occasion, they cut a little piece of Saul's robe to prove that they were there, that his life was in their hand. David could have said, now, God anointed me king. This is an evil man. I'm going to be king. Now is my chance and I can take it now. But David, the man after God's own heart, does what probably very few of us would have done. He waits on God. He trusts the promises of God. He believes that God in His own way and His own timing is going to bring him to be the king of Israel, as indeed he does. A wonderful example of not taking vengeance and trusting in God. Our flesh is always in a hurry, isn't it? Wait on God. You, you've been hurt very badly. You, you want justice? I understand that. I understand that. God understands it. Wait for God's time. Because Jesus taught us that we're to bless and pray for those who persecute us. We're to love our enemies in the face of opposition and difficulties. Be helpful and generous of spirit. You've got these family members that you think are very, very difficult, and they have made life miserable for you, and they've teamed up against you, and, and you, you, you feel very, very frustrated, and you, you're tempted to fight back. Don't do that. Don't do that. What you do, show them grace. Show them love. Bless them. That's what the Scripture is saying. Consider that person who's wronged you. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, verse 20. For in so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. You see, that's what I want to do. I want to get burning coals on his head. Wait a minute, what's it meaning? No, this is not retaliation. Paul may be referring uh, to an Egyptian ritual in which a man gave public evidence of his penitence by carrying a pan of burning coals on his head. It was uh, a symbol that he was repentant, that he was uh, ashamed. And the point is this, treat your enemy with love. Can, can you do that? Can you, can you love that person? Show them the love of God, and that love may lead them to repentance. That may lead them to be ashamed of themselves. And so, you can turn an enemy into a friend. Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to destroy your enemy is to make him your friend. Turn your enemy into a friend. Notice verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, you can either be conquered by evil and so increase the evil, and go through life with this deep bitterness, deep resentful, and you want to tell everyone who will listen to you the injustice, the terrible thing that happened to you, and you won't let it go, and it's like drinking your own poison. And your enemy is living his or her life, and here you are drinking your own poison. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Have the victory over evil. Show love. Show kindness. Be generous. Feed the person. Give them a drink. Help them. 
reach out to them with the very love of Christ, and that may lead to their repentance, and that may lead to the restoration of the relationship if there was one, but even if that doesn't work, that's the right thing to do because ultimately God will deal with the situation. What's Paul saying? This genuine love is demonstrated by not getting even in our words, in our attitudes, in our actions, but to wait on God who says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Now, some of you have been very wronged by a former husband, wife. Some of you have been terribly wronged by a child, by a parent, a friend, a boss, a business partner who took advantage of you and perhaps ruined you. You've been wronged perhaps by someone here at Calvary. What are you to do? Don't allow the evil done to you to drive you to return that evil. Trust God. Do what is right. Pray for that person who's wronged you. Can, can you do that? We will come to the table of the Lord. What a great opportunity. That resentment, that bitterness that you're carrying to let it go. And to see this person as someone's different, to see this person as someone whom God loves, although they may have strayed far from Him, and as far as you can, do all you can to live at peace with that person, to offer forgiveness, to offer reconciliation. Because what did our Lord say on the cross when He's been crucified? And no one was more wronged than Christ, absolutely perfect sinless. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Will you pray that for that person who's wronged you? And ask God as you once again drink, as we break bread, drink of that deep, deep love of Jesus, that that love will be shown to others. Help us, Father, to do that. This is difficult for us but this is the transformation of the gospel. We can only do this as we receive your love. We can only do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we break bread deep in our faith, may we drink of the deep, deep, deep love of Jesus, that it will be true of us as it was true of the Christians in the first century, that people would say how they loved one another. Help us not only to love one another, but to love our enemies and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We thank you for Christ and for his perfect example in his name. Amen.